Hey, this is Dave Wood, and in my last blog post about vision, I talked about how I've read about 250 books in the last 18 months. Most of the time, I wake up around 6 a.m. and I read till about noon. Through this habit, I end up reading a book every one to four days, depending, of course, on the length of the book. Through this, I've gained more depth in my perspective about everything from economics to psychology and many things in between, including politics, marketing, science, and more. The last book I read, which I'm holding in my hand, is called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. This book is about what the new science of psychedelics teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence. The subject is fascinating to me for a variety of reasons and personal experience because in 2017, I went through a dramatic and profound spiritual healing experience on May 20th facilitated by taking a high dosage psychedelic mixture I made while I was staying in Puerto Rico. That experience is beyond the scope of this message, but in the future, I might write or make a video of something about it. For now, it will suffice to say that I've been interested since that time period in the science of psychedelics and how they can positively impact the psychology, uh, spirituality, and emotionally health of both individuals and communities if administered properly. I picked up How to Change Your Mind because I wanted to understand some of the history behind psychedelics research and also some of the issues surrounding the movement. And I had an incredibly positive experience reading the book. In general, in bringing up psychedelics, also sometimes referred to as entheogens or hallucinogens, the response in conversations is completely mixed. One group of people tend to be incredibly positive towards psychedelics and another group tends to see them as something fringe that's taken by drug addicts and hippie types. But after reading this book, I'm convinced that the only reason, <laughs> this is bug flying in my face, the only reason someone would fall into that, into that latter category is that they're uneducated on the vast depth of research surrounding psychedelics and also their power to heal and integrate the personality. For example, in quoting a well-known paper called Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experiences Having Substantial and Sustained Personal Meaning and Spiritual Significance, Michael Pollan observes, the study demonstrated that a high dose of psilocybin could be used to safely and reliably occasion a mystical experience, typically described as the dissolution of one's ego, followed by a sense of merging with nature or the universe. Now, this might not come as news to people who take psychedelic drugs or to the researchers who first studied them back in the 1950s and 1960s, but it wasn't at all obvious to modern science or to me in 2006 when this paper was published. What was most remarkable about the results reported in the article is that participants ranked their psilocybin experience as one of the most meaningful in their lives comparable to the birth of the first child or the death of a parent. Two-thirds of the participants rated the session among the top five most spiritually significant experiences of their lives. One-third ranked it the most significant such experience in their lives. Fourteen months later, these ratings had only slipped slightly. The volunteers reported significant improvements in their personal well-being, life satisfaction, and positive behavior change. Changes that were confirmed by their family members and also their friends. How to Change Your Mind goes in depth into an incredible amount of history, research, and also subjective experience of the author, covering depth about studies and history related to LSD, psilocybin, and plant medicines such as ayahuasca and also 5-MeO-DMT, which is also known as the toad, as well as political reasons why this research has been suppressed, banned, or ignored throughout long periods of time. One thing that I like about Michael Pollan's book is that he recommends that people utilize these substances in controlled settings with facilitators pointing out on page 14 that it's important to distinguish what can happen when these drugs are used in uncontrolled situations without attention to their set and setting from what happens in clinical conditions after carefully screening people and under supervision. Since the revival of sanctioned psychedelic research beginning in the 1990s, nearly a thousand volunteers have been dosed and not a single serious adverse effect has been reported. More so, the incredible benefits to these psychedelic interventions are well documented in well over a thousand studies up to this point. On page 78, 
he points out that completed studies suggest that psilocybin, or rather the mystical state of consciousness that psilocybin occasions, may be useful in treating both addiction. In fact, a pilot study in smoking cessation achieved an 80% success rate, which is unprecedented, and the existential distress that often debilitates people facing a terminal diagnosis, such as cancer patients. When we last met, Griffiths was about to submit an article reporting striking results in the lab's trial using psilocybin to treat the anxiety and depression of cancer patients. The study found one of the largest treatment effects ever demonstrated for a psychiatric intervention. The majority of volunteers who had a mystical experience reported that their fear of death had either greatly diminished or completely disappeared. Psychedelic-induced mystical experiences produced profound, positive, and many times a permanent effect on the subjects of research studies. He quoted a letter from Huston Smith, a scholar of comparative religion that was written, that writ, wrote to Bob Jesse so, shortly after 2006, which stated that the John Hopkins experiment shows and proves that under controlled experimental conditions, psilocybin can occasion genuine mystical experiences. It uses science, which modernity trusts, to undermine modernity's secularism. In doing so, it offers hope of nothing less than a re-sacralization of the natural and social world, a spiritual revival that is our best defense against not only soullessness, but also against religious fanaticism, and it does so on the very teeth of unscientific prejudices built into our current drug laws. So when I had my first e experience in 2017 with this, I can testify to the perspective-altering, life-changing effects of entheogenic compounds. In a fashion, psychedelics have the power to decentralize spiritual experience, bringing the power of mystical realizations to anyone who desires to pursue them. This is deeply rooted in all through human history, as Michael Pollan points out when he says in the book that humans has been using psych psychedelic mushrooms for uh, sacramentally for at least 7,000 years, according to Stamets. But animals sometimes ingest them too for reasons that remain obscure. However, it's not just the effects that psychedelics have in creating mystical experiences for the users. There's a growing yet incredibly deep body of research in the utilization of psychedelic compounds to treat addictions. On page 40, 149, he references a study on alcohol, alcoholism where he says, here was an arresting application of the psycho, psychotomimetic paradigm use a single high-dose LSD session to induce an episode of madness in an alcoholic that would stimulate delirium tremens, shocking the patient into sobriety. Over the next decade, Osman and Hoffer tested this hypothesis on more than 700 alcoholics. 700, and in roughly half of the cases, they reported the treatment worked. The volunteers got sober and remained so for at least several months. So not only was the new approach more effective than other therapies, but it suggested a whole way of thinking about psychopharmacology. From the first, Hoffer wrote, we considered it not the chemical, but the experience as a key factor in therapy. This novel idea would become a central tenet of psychedelic therapy. If you noticed, he mentioned that half of the people got sober. Most people don't know this, but Will, Bill Wilson, who's the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, credited his own sobriety to a psychedelic experience on belladona, an alkaloid plant with hallucinogenic properties that was given to him at Towns Hospital in Manhattan in 1934. AA, or Alcoholics Anonymous, has a sobriety percentage of between 8 and 12% success in comparison to the study of 50%. The book even mentions on page 153 that Bill, Bill th uh, thought there might be a place for LSD therapy in Alcoholics Anonymous, but his colleagues on the board of the fellowship strongly disagreed, believing that to condone any use of mind-altering substances risks muddying the organization's brand and message. This falls in line with a general pattern of societal suppression for psychedelic usage that I've observed in my own experience and is also pointed out in the book. LSD, which stands for lysergic acid diethylalmate, I don't even know if I can say that, is listed as a Schedule I substance in the United States since the 1970s, which has effectively shut down research 
into the vast majority of psychedelic sub substances, even though at the time there was over a thousand clinical studies that have been completed uh, with much of the psychiatric community declaring LSD to be a wonder drug. I've often thought about this in historical context, and it seems to me that the psychedelics movement in the 1960s produced a generation of people that were in rebellion against the authority structures, with many unwilling to participate in the Vietnam War. I've wondered personally if the war on drugs was actually started to shut down the social rebellion and bring people back into submission to the general propaganda of the government at the time. I guess I'll have to read more history to find that one out. One thing's for certain, though. If someone majorly objects to the reclassification of psychedelic substances, it's not because there's no scientific proof as to their effectiveness in personal transformation or in the treatment of mental illness. It's simply because the person either hasn't read any of the vast empirical research studies or because they simply are stuck in a pattern of maintaining their previous belief systems and are unwilling to look at the evidence. The evidence is actually empirical and clear that psychedelics can create healing and liberation to many people who are suffering from addiction and other ailments such as depression. And if you question that, I would encourage you to pick up a copy of How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan and read his detailed historical and also fair breakdown. One thing that's fascinating in the literature surrounding psychedelics encounters is the incredible depth and transformative power of the mystical experiences people have. He points out, according to scholars of mysticism, these shared traits generally include a vision of unity in which all things, including the self, are subsumed, expressed in the phrase, all is one, a sense of certainty about one has perceived, which could be said as knowledge has been revealed to me, feelings of joy, blessedness, and satisfaction, and a transcendence of the categories we rely on to organize the world, such as time, space, or self, and others, a sense that Whatever has been apprehended uh, is somehow sacred. Wordsworth says that some, something far more deeply infused with meaning and often paradoxical, so while the self may vanish, awareness abides. The last thing is the conviction that the experience is ineffable, even as thousands of words are expended in the attempt to communicate its power. Now, I know from personal experience the power in mystical experiences, as do many others in the healing of the mind and emotions from all kinds of ailments. As he mentions in the book, a person called Carhart Harris believes that people suffering from a whole range of disorders characterized by excessive, excessively rigid patterns of thought, including addiction, obsessions, and eating disorders, as well as depression, stand to benefit from the ability of psychedelics to disrupt stereotyped patterns of thought and behavior by disintegrating the patterns of neural activity upon which they rest. This healing ability comes from the ability that psychedelics have to unify different areas of the brain and create a more holistic perception of the world. Distinct networks, he says, become less distinct under the drug. Carhart Harris and his colleagues also wrote that implying that they communicate more openly with other brain networks, the brain operates with greater flexibility and interconnectedness under hallucinogens. But when the brain operates under the influence of psilocybin, thousands of new connections form in the brain, linking far-flung brain regions that during normal waking consciousness don't exchange much information. Essentially, traffic is rerouted from a relatively small number of interstate highways onto myriad smaller roads linking a great many more destinations. The brain appears to then become less specialized and more globally interconnected with considerably more intercourse or crosstalk among various neighborhoods. This is powerful because many ailments of human consciousness come from the mind being disjointed and disconnected. The unconscious mind falling out of alignment with the conscious, the mind separating into parts that then war against each other. He mentions in the book that if psychedelic therapy proves successful, it will because it succeeds in rejoining the brain and mind in the practice of psychotherapy. At least that's what the promise is. He points out two researchers, Stephen Ross and Tony Bosis, in the New York University treatment room, whose excitement could not be contained in the research that was being done with cancer patients. At first, Ross couldn't believe what he was seeing. He said, I thought the first 10 or 20 people were plants, that they must be faking it. They were saying things like, 
I understand love is the most powerful force on the planet, or I had an encounter with my cancer, cancer, this black cloud of smoke. People were journeying to early parts of their lives and coming back with a profound new sense of things, new priorities. People who had been palpably scared of death, they lost that fear. The fact that a drug given once could have such an effect for so long is an unprecedented finding. We've never had anything like that in the psychiatric field. So this book goes into an incredible amount of detailed descriptions on mystical experiences of people involved in studies, the remapping of the neurology of the brain in the midst of psychedelic experience, and the profound life-changing effects on people, from the alleviation of depression and cancer subjects to the breaking of age-old addictions and profoundly altering uh, the direction of people's lives. Overall, reading How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pullen was a positive experience for me, and I feel more educated on the current political and social issues surrounding psychedelics, as well as the positive potential impact that they can have in people's lives if the government removed the decades-long ban on their distribution and use. Overall, I have become convinced more than ever that the governments of the world should generally stay out of people's personal business and allow them to pursue what they believe is best for themselves that, to me, seems in line with the principle of the freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what do you think about psychedelics? Please leave me your thoughts in the comments below and let me know if you decide to go ahead and pick up a copy of the book. I hope you enjoy this video. I'm going to be producing reviews of this, of books that I like. And, of course, if you want to work with David Wood, you can follow me on my blog at workwithdavidwood.com. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the beaches of the world.